Okay, before I get rolling with the presentation, I just want to take a moment to ask your indulgence a little bit. This presentation may be a, a little bit different from a lot of the ones you ordinarily see, which are focused on one country or one period of time or one event, right? What we're going to be looking at today is a phenomenon that's truly Pan-American in nature. It occurs on coins and currency in, well, particularly coins, in um, a number of countries throughout the Americas, including the United States. So I'm going to invite you to take a journey with me to, to look at some of these coins from various countries and to see this phenomenon that um, I believe heretofore has been uh, fairly unappreciated. Uh, but it's pretty neat to see how these countries essentially um, uh, did, did the same thing in the wake of revolution. All right, my talks are an interesting combination of text and image because in many years of teaching, I've learned that one of the best ways for people to process information is to have both text and image. So you're going to get both text and image uh, this evening. All right, without any further ado, as you said then, let's go ahead and I want to introduce you to the focus of my research. Okay, when we think of money, we usually focus on its monetary value, but it is also a powerful medium for symbolic communication. Many countries use imagery on currency to help build their national identities. An archaeologist, I'm interested in how people root their identity in their past or native heritage uh, using archaeological and indigenous imagery. Here, I treat the use of Native American images at the time of independence on coins across the Americas from the US and Mexico to Costa Rica and Colombia. So we're going to take a survey throughout the New World, basically, beginning here in the U.S., moving to Mexico and Colombia and then to uh, Costa Rica. And what we're going to see is that the same phenomenon occurred in all of these countries, not necessarily at the same time, but in the same stage, right in the wake of independence. And it occurred in countries that were both part of the English and the Spanish colonial spheres. So this is a phenomenon that crosses the boundaries of the great imperial orders of the colonial uh, era, all right? I want to introduce you first to a couple of concepts that I use uh, in my research. Uh, I employ two main investigative tools, a bit like semiotics, if you're familiar with that, uh, the study of signs. The first one I call visual linguistics. Uh, I read American coins and paper money, uh, and by American, I mean the Americas, not the United States alone, okay? like Western texts from front to back, top to bottom, and left to right, with images accented by their size, placement, or embellishment, and the denomination or number circulated. The other concept I want to introduce you to is the imaginario. That's a group of visual, textual, or verbal images that project a shared or desired association, sort of like a photo mosaic or a, so a photo array on social media for those of you who are present on social media. So to illustrate, basically when I look at coins or metals, I start from the left and I work to the right. I notice that some things can be accented by their size or the centrality of their placement, uh, essentially. And the front or obverse takes a step before the reverse in terms of prioritizing uh, the imagery. Uh, you'll see this play out as I analyze some of the pieces uh, through my talk this evening. And then the imaginario, like I said, is kind of like a photo mosaic, right? So here you see a photo mosaic. It's composed of images, uh, actually from the Bush administration, arranged to create a, an American flag, a U.S. flag, right? And countries have done this for a long time. They've used currencies to build imaginarios that have like a meta image that they're meant to communicate. And they draw their imagery from other imaginarios that exist before them, all right? So if you understand at least on a, on, a, on a basic level, these two concepts of sort of visual linguistics and the imaginario, I think you'll see them well illustrated in the course of the presentation. All right, so with those two steps behind, let's turn now to what I call uh, the, the image of Native America. Early in the colonial era, Westerners came to view the world as composed of four continents, each personified by its own race and signature indigenous avatar, often a woman. America is depicted semi-nude with a feathered headdress and skirt bearing native arms, a bow, an arrow, and a quiver. She is commonly portrayed with, and sometimes riding, 
exotic American animals like an armadillo, an alligator, or parrot. And she is frequently associated with a cornucopia signifying her riches and, interestingly enough, a severed head signaling her savage nature. So let's unpack Native America here through some images. And I begin with this map from Stupendal in 1730. And if you look, you'll notice that each of the corners of the universe is occupied by a figure. Each of these figures represents one of the world's four great continents. So Europe, of course, is upper left, given priority, because Stupendal was himself European. Asia, upper right. Africa, lower left and America, lower right. We're not gonna focus so much on these other figures, but we are gonna take a very close look at America. And as you see, she wears a feathered headdress, she's holding a bow, she has a quiver. Uh, these are some of the basic accoutrements that signal her uh, identity. This identity was already forming basically less than a century after Columbus came to the New World. So here's a print by Collard from 1590, and it shows America, right? And she's got her feathered headdress, she's got her bow, her quiver. This time she has a tomahawk. She's riding a giant armadillo, looks like something out of a horror movie, right? And here's our parrot. Uh, she's semi-nude because she's wild, okay? Unlike uh, Europe, uh, who's always depicted, uh, you know, with, uh, with heavy gowns uh, and such like that. So this image was already solidifying in less than a hundred years after contact between Europe and the old world. All right, it's an image that's become lost to many of us today, but 400 years ago, this was familiar to anybody in the European sphere, in the old world or the new, as you'll see. Okay, here you see her expressed in mice and porcelains from the mid 1700s. Well, you see Europe, you see Asia, you see Africa again. We'll take a closer look at America here. She has a feathered skirt. She's got her parrot, feathered headdress. She is semi-nude. There's our cornucopia. In this case, she's on an alligator. Again, some of the basic accoutrements that, uh, that identify her. All right, and we'll see people um, improvise on this theme uh, in the U.S., Costa Rica, Colombia, and Mexico. All right. Uh, here is the frontis from Blau's 1662 atlas. Uh, there's no mistake about who she is. She's labeled right here. You can identify her by the different features. In this case, she is holding the arrow that I referred to earlier, but the most startling inclusion in this image is the human head at her feet. Okay, and in this time, it looks like a European head, and as you'll notice, it's been pierced by an arrow. So she's wild, she's free, she's dangerous, basically. And that's part of the imagery that American countries wanted to cultivate as they gained their independence. All right, so let's begin by looking at some coins. And we'll start here in the US, which may be the most familiar to many of us here. We'll take a look at the 1785 Confederatio Copper. Following independence, the Native America figure was appropriated and merged with liberty on an experimental national coin here in the US. The obverse features a standing female leaning against a stand. She kind of resembles seated liberty, as you'll see in a moment. She's marked as America because she's got a native quiver at her back, a bow in her left hand and an arrow in her right. She's labeled as America by the surrounding legend, which in English, it's, it's, it's written in Latin, but in English renders as America, foe of tyrants. She recalls Liberty with a helmet atop a sta the stand, and her right foot is trampling a crown, much like we just saw the America figure trampling a head. All right? Um, and she's clearly related to national identity because the reverse of the coin um, shows 13 stars and is labeled Confederatio, hence the name. So she's being associated with U.S. national identity. Here is the coin. You see the obverse right here the reverse over here, and the legend, America Animica Tyrannis, America Foe of Tyrants. Now, as we zoom in a little bit, you get a better view of her on the obverse. We'll come even closer still, and I'll draw out the key features, our bow, our quiver, our arrow, here's the pedestal with the helmet on it, and the crown 
beneath her feet right here. All right. This is a pretty dramatic representation that we're looking at. And parts of it were kind of borrowed on later versions of the New York State um, uh, coat of arms. So there's a trampled crown here on later New York State coat of arms. Uh, again, reminiscent of the trampled crown or trampled head that we saw on the uh, frontis from the Blow Atlas uh, from 1662 uh, a little while ago. Who knew that liberty on our state seal here in New York actually had her roots in some of this imagery that was developed on coins, all right? Now, when we turn to the original proposal of that coin, we learn something very interesting about her inclusion on it. While discussing prospects for the first national coinage of the U.S., Superintendent of Finance Robert Morris described the initial concept for this coin. There are some changes made, but it's this coin. And he, called, he says, it's an Indian, his right foot on a crown, a bow in his left hand, and his right hand 13 arrows, well, there's one now, and the inscription, Manus Inimicaturanus, this hand opposes tyranny. But it's the same coin. They made some changes when they finally um, uh, minted it. The fact that native liberty was included in this discussion of the very first kind of U.S. federal coin and appears on these test coins tells us that she was considered for and nearly adorned one of our very first coins here in the U.S. That's how prominent this forgotten figure was back in the days of revolution and its immediate as aftermath. Okay, let's take a look at a New York coin now. All right, from the same vantage point of the use of this kind of figure. After independence, Native America figures were employed on state coins, mostly coppers, to represent U.S. and or state identity and liberty. The obverse of the 1787 Excelsior copper features a standing native, probably and possibly a male in this case, semi-nude and barefoot in a skirt, wearing a feathered headdress and quiver with a bow and tomahawk in hand. The reverse bears the New York State coat of arms. The native weapons and garb denote indigenous U.S. identity and the natural free state of humanity. The weapons further evoke resistance to subordination. So let's look at our coin. And here you see the obverse, the reverse, with the state coat of arms. So in this case, this figure is not being associated so much with our national identity as it is with a state identity. It seems to have worked in uh, different capacities uh, at times. Okay, zooming in on that obverse and analyzing its components, we see once again the quiver, the feathered headdress, tomahawk, skirt, uh, the individual's barefoot, here's a bow, and semi-nude. And what's really telling is the legend that surrounds the figure, okay? Pardon me, libertatis libertatum defendo. Basically, born free, I defend liberty. All right, so this wild figure, this savage in European eyes is being extolled here in the Americas as a sign of natural human freedom, that we are born free. Of course, a concept that we enshrined in nothing less than our constitution here in the United States. All right, and here you see it appearing on state coinage immediately in the wake of the revolution. Let's move to some of the coinage of Massachusetts. And in particular, um, we find a Native American figure appeared on post-independent coin, uh, post coins there as well. On the obverses of the 18, uh, 1787 and 1788 cents and half cents, uh, they present a standing Native male with plumed headdress, moccasin, tunic, bow and arrow, facing a star, flanked by the legend Commonwealth. Again, it recalls native identity and liberty. The image is also Massachusetts coat of arms. It was adopted in 1780 and derived from the 1629 seal of the Bay Colony. The reverse in this case features a federal eagle, which would seem to associate the figure with national identity, but it's surrounded by the legend, Massachusetts. So this one kind of does double duty for both the country and the state. Here is a 1787 half cent. You see the obverse here, the reverse. Here's our federal eagle. Here's our legend, Massachusetts. And of course, Commonwealth uh, over here on the obverse. Uh, zooming in, 
We see the various portions. There's a feathered or plumed headdress here, an arrow, a tunic, right? Moccasins, bow, and here's the star. And like I said, this is actually a figure from the Massachusetts State Coat of Arms. You basically see the exact same kind of individual here, right down to the star. Uh, and uh, this was uh, first proposed and adopted between 1775 and 1780, which of course are banner years here in the United States and in Massachusetts. We're talking about you know, the full throat of the American Revolution uh, at this time, uh, essentially. Okay, and this is the seal of the Bay Colony from the 1600s. All right, and you can see we've got a very similar figure here with a downturn arrow, the bow, and then I love the little cartoon balloon here, come over and help us, basically. So think about the contradictions here. She's holding weapons, and on the other hand, she's beckoning people to come to the Americas. Right? There's a lot of very interesting nuance taking place uh, symbolically uh, in these materials. Um, let's talk for a moment where she came from and a relationship in particular with the image of Britannia. It's long been recognized that such native uh, or U.S. allegories of liberty were inspired by the English figure of Britannia. Early U.S. coins often replaced the colonial Britannia with a nearly identical liberty seated atop the Western Hemisphere with a U.S. escutcheon on her shield and Phrygian cap of liberty atop her lance. Native liberty was not just modeled after Britannia, as you're going to see, but she was presented as a direct counterpunch to Britannia, symbolizing a distinctly U.S. identity in opposition to England, as can be seen in Independence-era political cartoons. So here we see a colonial coin, right, um, with Britannia on it. It even says Britannia right here. And now we switch to an early U.S. coin, right? I mean, they're clearly modeling liberty here. She's got a liberty cap after her, and there is the New York State coat of arms on the shield in this case, right? So there's a clear relationship between these liberty figures and uh, Britannia. Um, liberty is the opposite of Britannia. Britannia is monarchy and tyranny. Liberty is freedom. And liberty is U.S. Okay? Here's one of those colonial cartoons I was talking about. We could spend an hour taking this apart. But let's just start with some of the basics. This is clearly Britannia. How do you know? There's a Union Jack on her escutcheon. Right? This is America. How do you know? Well, for one thing, it says America over here. Okay, but look who's standing behind Britannia. It's the devil, <laughs> all right? I mean, some of these cartoons are absolutely amazing in how forward they are. And, and of course, if you look at the flag here, you see the American flag atop um, the pole right behind her. And she's got a lance with a liberty cap, but she's also a Native American. How do we know? Let's zoom in down below. She's got a bow, and she's got an arrow right here, okay? Again, two symbols signaling her identity, that she's not just a European liberty figure, she's an American liberty figure, totally distinct from Europe. This is from 1782. This print was produced on the eve of the Paris Accords that ended our Revolutionary War or here in the United States. So this is America flexing some symbolic muscle, basically. Here's one of my other favorite cartoons. Now we have Britannia dressed as in an 18th century figure, right? And we have clearly America over here on the right. And in her little word bubble, it says, liberty, liberty forever, mother, while I exist. Can you read the one over here? I'll force you to obedience, you rebellious slut. <laughs> no joke. So, right, some of this iconography is incredibly colorful. This is tame compared to some of the ones that I didn't show tonight, <laughs> right? But it gives you an idea of how vivid these ideas were and that what you're looking at here in these images is not just monetary value, but sheer symbolic combat taking place, iconographic warfare being conducted on coinage. Right? So in the wake of independence, 
Before there was an Uncle Sam or Brother Jonathan, the U.S., as you've just seen, represented itself as native liberty, a sort of anti-Algonquin. And we've kind of forgotten about this. But when you know this, it leads you to recognize significance and other things that you might have missed. So let me give you one example of what I mean, the Boston Tea Party. So knowing about this figure, the Boston Tea Party Raiders did not just disguise themselves as Native Americans. They assumed a separatist American identity. That's what they were doing. All right, and that's something that many of us have missed when you're unfamiliar with this figure. This figure would have been known to the Tea Partiers. Right? They were stuffing it in Britain's face. They were saying, we are American. That's who we are, okay? By donning these Native American costumes. That's what was happening here. All right, let's move along now to Mexico and look at Native Mexican liberty. Mexico synthesized its own Native liberty icon in the years surrounding its War of Independence, which lasted from 1810 to 1821. An Aztec woman, woman, she generally wears a feathered headdress and an embroidered weepil gown, which is typical of the Aztec. She bears indigenous weapons, a quiver, an Aztec sword, and is accompanied by a cornucopia, which we saw earlier. On colonial art and metals, she embodied Mexican dependency and is often juxtaposed with Minerva, representing Spain. After independence, she was rebranded from a subordinate position right, to, uh, to, to represent liberty and to personify Mexican autonomy, uh, a Tia Mexica or anti-Aztec. So the same figure was used by the Spaniards to represent Mexican subordination. And then after the war, it was appropriated by Mexican nationalists to represent Mexican independence. It gets transformed, all right? So we're gonna talk about coins from two places, uh, San Luis Potosí first, and Chihuahua in Mexico, right? And we're gonna begin by looking at some metals because we can actually trace the migration of this America's figure from the map that we saw earlier or the frontis from the atlas that we saw earlier to coins through metals. So here you see a medal from 1746, a Spanish medal. It shows us Ferdinand VI, this is the year that he ascended to the throne. So this celebrates his ascension. And who do we see here bowing before him? We see Europe, we see Asia, we see Africa. Hell, Africa's wearing an elephant head for a cap, essentially. And who's that? America. That's America, right there. You can see her feathered headdress. Once again, she's topless because she's a savage. She's kneeling. And Europe, in this case, isn't just Europe. Does anybody know what that rabbit means down at her feet? Spain. Spain. Ever since Roman times, Spain has been represented by a rabbit. So here, Europe is being represented as a Spanish figure. All right, so this is, we see the actual migration of this four continent iconography onto a numismatic related medium a medal. Now we're gonna see this figure transformed into a Mexican figure, appropriated um, by New Spain before um, the, uh, the War of Independence. Okay, here's a medal from 1780 by Jeronimo Antonio Gil, a great um, engraver, in fact, the chief engraver at the Mint in Mexico City. We see Spain here. She's represented as Minerva, so this is basically Hispania. Hispania is the same as Britannia for Britain, okay? We can tell that this is Spain, how? There's a rabbit. We can also tell by the, this escutcheon right here. She is handing a baby to this individual. The baby is a newly born Prince Charles or Carlos of the Spanish crown, right? Who is she handing it to? This is not just an America figure anymore. She's wearing an Aztec weepil or gown, and she's kneeling before Spain. She's on the right, a secondary position. Spain is on the left, a primary position. She's clearly subordinate in this image, all right? Her Mexicanness continues to be developed 
and subsequent metals. Oh, and by the way, what do we have here? Cornucopia. We have our cornucopia signaling the riches of Mexico. And back here we have an escutcheon, and guess what's on it? The coat of arms of New Spain or Mexico. So there's absolutely no doubt about the identity of this individual. America has now been appropriated and recast as Mexico here in a subordinate position during colonial times. We move now to the end of the Mexican Revolution. One of the very first medals issued was to commemorate the, not only the defeat of Spain, but the rise of Iturbide, one of the warlords of Mexico, to become Mexico's, quote, first emperor. Who do we see now in the primary position? Look at her weepil, it's gorgeous. It's a classic Mexican Aztec weepil. You see her feathered headdress, and what's she doing? She's presenting a laurel crown to Iturbide. She's crowning Iturbide, the first emperor of Mexico. Who's in the secondary position? On the right, Iturbide. So she's actually in the primary position. That, look at the symbolic reversal here. A moment ago, she was kneeling before the Spanish crown. Now there is no Spain, and she's doing the crowning. All right, same image, completely appropriated and redirected by the new nationalists of Mexico right immediately at the end of the Mexican War of Independence. The next time we see her is on this medal, issued in 1828 by San Luis Potosí. Here she is, you can actually see the embroidery on her gown. She's seated on a pedestal. Here's our cornucopia. Well, hell, I'll go through these again in a moment. But the bottom line essentially is we have emblazoned above her, Mexico Libre. And what does she have sitting on top of this shaft? Liberty a Liberty Cap. And are there any other figures on here? Cactus. Yeah, well, people. No. She's now the only figure in the entire field. That's quite a metamorphosis over these years, all right? And it all reflects what's going on in the history and the warfare of Mexico. That same year, San Luis Potosí issues this Quarter Real. It's the exact same image, right down to Mexico Libre on the top here. She occupies this coin until 1862. Do you know what happened in 1862 in Mexico? Maximilian. Maximilian. France took advantage of U.S. preoccupation with the Civil War to invade and take over Mexico and install their own emperor, who put an end to this coinage. Why? Dangerous. Nationalist coinage. This is what I'm going to explore tomorrow in our money talk. Okay? So if we take a closer look, we see the cornucopia here, her weepil gown. This is a maqua weetl. It's an Aztec sword, very deadly sword. Uh, uh, holds an edge about a thousand times sharper than surgical steel. Here's her bow and quiver, her feathered crown, her Phrygian cap of liberty. That's actually an arrow. Okay? Her nopal cactus and the pedestal that she's sitting on, all right? This is a complete transformation of this figure that's taken place, and it directly corresponds to the political and ethnic currents that were defining a new Mexico in the wake of her separation from Spain at the time. Uh, here is an allegory from 1834. It's practically the same figure that's on our coin a moment ago. In this case, she's being crowned with a laurel wreath by Hidalgo, one of the heroes of Mexican independence, and her chain tying her to Ferdinand VII, the king of Spain, <coughs> is being broken by Iturbide, the short-lived uh, emperor of Mexico in the wake of independence. Here's our Macuahuitl. There's another quiver. Here's her feathered headdress, right? This imagery was so powerful that in this painting by Jose Ignacio Paz, of the coronation of Iturbide as Emperor of Mexico in 1822, look who's putting the crown on Iturbide. She is. And check out this one. This is Iturbide's wife, dressed as native Mexico. There's the quiver. 
there's the feathered headdress, right? So the wife of the first emperor of Mexico is being represented in this painting as the same figure that we just saw on those medals and coins. That tells you something really powerful about this image. It was current, it was known, right? And it, it had force with people or they never would have used it. It was familiar. It may not be now, but it clearly, clearly was back then, okay? And one of the most interesting images that I found in my research was this one, which is published at least three times in different journals in Europe. And uh, it shows an 1865 religious procession in San Luis Potosí, which is the same city that minted that medal and minted those coins. Who do we have here? Native Mexico. Well, what's interesting about this is in 1865, who was ruling Mexico? Maximilian. Maximilian. So what is this? This is probably a really subtle way of thumbing their nose at Maximilian by having this figure participate in the procession. And then hysterically, it was reproduced all over Europe. And the folks who reproduced it probably had no idea this was the Mexicans taking the Mickey out of them, essentially, when they did this. All right, so this is a very, very important figure that uh, really hasn't gotten uh, very much attention uh, not just in numismatic circles, but you know, even in historical circles in Mexico, uh, for that matter. Let's look at another Mexican coin, the one from Chihuahua. After independence, a native figure was introduced on a series of fractional reales, uh, copper reales, kind of like state coppers here in the US, issued in Chihuahua between 1833 and 1856. The figure is a, fronting sta a frontal standing native at the center of the obverse, possibly a male, with bow, arrow, quiver, tunic, plumed headdress, and an encircling legend that celebrates state autonomy. Um, the figure represents a Chichimec, who were the ancestors of the Aztecs, and of Mexico for that matter, and are emblematic of, in Mexico of humanity in its wild, native, free state. Uh, it could also celebrate some of the indigenous allies of the revolutionary insurgents of the day. And the fact that it was issued in such low denominations means it might have actually reached some of those um, native allies of the Mexican revolutionists. But here's the coin. Huh. Remind you of anything? Doesn't this look a hell of a lot like that Excelsior coin we saw here in the U.S.? Right? It's very much the same kind of figure. And the legend says the sovereign state of Chihuahua uh, around it. We've got a plumed headdress. It's hard to make out. Most of these coins are horribly worn. This is actually a really well-preserved one, believe it or not. We have our arrow, we have our bow, we have our tunic, and we have our quiver. It's the exact same kind of figure we just saw on US coins, right? And it looks an awful lot like contemporary paintings of the Chichimec, the ancestors of the Aztecs in Mexico. Back in the 1800s and 1700s, the Chichimec were used oftentimes as a metaphor for savage, free people. Kind of like libertatum, or libertatis, libertatum defendo, like we saw in the Excelsior coin in the US. Once again, quiver, bow, feathers, okay? He actually has an arrow in his hand um, as well. Let's move on now to Colombia, and we'll begin with Cartagena. Uh, Revolutionary Colombia issued coins uh, with Native, Ameri uh, Native American figures as well, beginning with Cartagena, the epicenter of separatism. Following Colombia's declaration of independence in 1811, Cartagena released a series of copper reales from 1812 to 1815. The obverse features a Native woman seated before a palm, a turpial bird eating from a pomegranate, in her hand. It actually depicts the coat of arms of autonomous Cartagena, the pomegranate, or Granada in Spanish, representing sovereign New Granada, which is what they called themselves at the time. And it also echoes revolutionary art of the same time period. So once more, we'll turn to a map for those of you who are unfamiliar with this territory. This is the country of Colombia. Here's Cartagena. At uh, the time of this map in 1820, this was still loyalist country and this was still loyalist country, but this was rebel country. 
We're going to look at a coin from Cartagena, and we're going to look at a coin from Cundinamarca, which is the main rebel territory in Colombia uh, back then. Uh, here is the Cartagena coin. Um, or, or, excuse me, I'll introduce the Cartagena coin uh, right here. Um, oh, here we go. Hit it the wrong way. Sorry. There's our map. We'll zoom in. Here's our coin. Right? And um, again, these are not well minted and they haven't fared very well through time. But bottom line essentially is you're looking at a coconut palm tree here, a woman seated, feathered headdress, quiver on her back, hand up holding a pomegranate. Here's our turpial bird, right? And um, she's wearing a feathered headdress. Again, difficult to make out, but those are feathers right there. It's actually easier to see when you look at the seal of Cartagena. Here is the seal of Cartagena. So what did they do? They basically did the same thing Massachusetts did. They took their seal and they put it on a coin. And their seal happened to celebrate this Native American liberty figure, right? We also can understand it a little bit better. I mean, you, you can see here, for example, her quiver. Here's the pomegranate. Here's the turpial bird, right? Um, here's the broken chains connecting her to, to Spain essentially, but we can also understand it better when we look at the art of Colombia, of the revolutionary era, right? And here is a painting called The Indian of Liberty. It says that right here from 1819, right? And here she is. Her feathers are actually the colors of Colombia, the colors of the Colombian flag. She has a lance with a Phrygian cap on it. She has a quiver back here. And oh, what's she sitting on? Can you see it? It's an alligator, yeah, okay. And what's behind her? The coconut palm that we just saw on the coin and in the seal of Cartagena. And kind of like the way Iturbide's wife wore the guise of native Mexican liberty, check out this one with Bolivar. Look who he's got his arm around. That's our figure. Only this time, she's not Mexican, she's what? She's Colombian. She represents Colombia. Like I said, in this case, her colors are the colors of Colombia. Even today, those are the colors of Colombia, okay? So what we're looking at is different countries appropriating the Americas figure from centuries earlier and making her theirs. That's what's happening, right? And we see it again when we look at the issues of Cundinamarca. So the rebel territory of Cundinamarca emitted a series of silver reales uh, coins bearing busts of our Native American icon in both, both uh, during and after the War of Independence, which in Colombia lasted from 1812 basically to 1821. During the war, 1812 to 1819, they featured her left profile wearing a feathered headdress flanked by the legend American Liberty on the obverse and a pomegranate for New Granada, Nueva Granada on the reverse. As hostilities concluded and freedom took hold in Colombia in 1820 and 1821, the head remained the same, but the obverse legend was replaced by Republic of Colombia. So here she is on that very first release. This is one from 1813. You see the pomegranate on the back here? It's, it's kind of like rebus writing. I don't know if you're familiar with rebus writing. The name for this in Spanish is the same as the name of the province. So if you can't read, you can recognize that. All right? So very sophisticated use of imagery here, basically. If we pull in on the obverse, you see American liberty, libertad americana here. And what do we have? We have a bust of our figure in Colombia. And when the war is ending, she's no longer just American liberty because Bolivar was fighting for not just Colombia, but a number of countries in South America. She now becomes the Republica de Colombia in 1821. So the same figure is appropriated by these different countries in the wake of independence to send virtually identical political and ethnic signals, all right? Now we'll finish with Costa Rica. And we'll begin with one of my favorites, what I call Native Madonna. 
Costa Rica featured an indigenous woman on its very first constitutional issue in 1847, along with Mexico, Central, Central America became independent from Spain in 1821. Um, they then became independent from Mexico in 1823, and Costa Rica finally declared itself independent from Central America uh, and passed its own constitution in 1847. In commemoration, it released a silver real that was adopted as a regular issue. There's a lone coffee shrub on the front, on the obverse, and a native Madonna nurses a swathed child on the reverse. The Madonna and child serve as a metaphor for the, new, the birth of the new nation of Costa Rica. Okay, so <clears throat> here you see map situating Costa Rica for you. Like I said, all of Central America became independent from Spain in um, 1821, along with Mexico. For the first two years, it remained a part of Mexico. But in 1823, Costa Rica separated from Mexico and tried to form its own republic. They experimented with this for a couple of decades. The experiment failed. And in 1847, Costa Rica became fully independent. And that's the year of our coin. Okay? So this, it's, this connection with independence is, is quite clear. Here is that one real commemorative coin from 1847. It is the first sovereign issue of Costa Rica. You see the coffee shrub on the front and our native Madonna figure on the reverse. And if we zoom in a little bit closer, you'll see that she's cradling a swathed child here. In later issues, she's labeled Central America. Mm. This then must be Costa Rica, being born from Central America, okay? We also have a Native Liberty figure on Costa Rican coins. Native America appears on Costa Rican gold escudo and ounce coins from 1850 to 1863, right in the wake of independence. The obverse shows the coat of arms, or the escudo, of Costa Rica, with the legend, Republica de Costa Rica, arching above. The reverse shows a female figure standing semi-nude with plumed crown, feathered skirt, bow and arrows in hand, leaning, liberty-like, against a pedestal inscribed with the date of Central American independence, the 15th of September, 1821. And the legend flanking above says Central America. It celebrates Costa Rica's triple independence, first from Spain, then from Mexico, then from Central America. Here is the gold half escudo. You see the um, coat of arms of Costa Rica here on the left, and here is our standing liberty figure on the right. I'm gonna zoom in on the pattern coin for the one ounce gold version because it's in pristine condition and you can see the details really, really nicely. Um, remind you of anything? Do you remember our confederatio sent from the US with a native woman leaning against the pedestal? Right, it's practically identical to it just 75 years later on the at the time of Costa Rican independence. If we zoom in closely on the top portion, we see her plume. We can quite clearly see that she's semi-nude, right? Again, signaling her wild and savage character in the, uh, the sort of uh, the, the ways of, of those times. We see she has a feathered skirt. She holds, an a she holds two arrows and a bow in her hand. And over here on the pedestal is the date of independence from Spain. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at the same phenomenon occurring in four different countries throughout the Americas in two entirely different imperial regimes, the English and the Spanish colonial spheres. Mm -hmm. This is pretty remarkable. Now, how did this happen? Well, in the case of Costa Rica, it's possible that Costa Rica got some of this symbolism from Mexico. Remember, Costa Rica was part of New Spain and Mexico until 1823. Costa Rica may have been aware of those Mexican symbolic developments. Remember our Aztec woman from the metals and the coin? On the other hand, Costa Rica is right next to, right, now we call this Panama, but at this time this was what? Columbia. This was Colombia. 
So Colombian coins circulated in Costa Rica, including the ones with the Native Liberty bust on them, right? So Costa Rica could have picked up some of this symbolism from both the South and the North. I'm going to finish by pointing out the significance of all this for later revivals. All right, we have this same, Im same imagery being revived decades, even over a century later on American and other coins. Echoing this heritage, Native Liberty has been revived, especially in bust versions, rendering it one of the most enduring motifs on U.S. and even other coins and paper monies. In the U.S. from 1854 to today, on Long Acre's Indian Head cent, Gold Dollar and Three Dollar, on St. Gowden's Gold Eagle, on Pratt's Quarter and Half Eagles, on Fraser's Buffalo Nickel, and on the current Sacagawea Dollar. They're rooted in this symbolism. This is where it comes from, okay? In the Dominican Republic, from 1891 until 1977, we find it on, we find Native Liberty on first their Francos, then their Pesos and Centavos on both coins and currency. So when you look at an Indian head sent now and you see the headdress with the word Liberty on it, can you see how it's based and rooted in what I've just presented? And if we come to our current Sacagawea dollar, what's she sitting below? Liberty. This is one of the most penetrating themes on American coinage from our very inception at the end of the revolution until today. And I didn't even speak about the Dominican Republic, but here's one of their francos minted in Paris in 1891. She's clearly a Native American figure and what she got in her headband? Libertad, liberty. This is practically the same figure on as, on our, as on our Indian head pennies, right? And she was transposed into vignettes that were put on paper money. Here's a 1975 specimen with her right here on the left. 85 plus years after she appears on coins, okay, in um, the Dominican Republic. So, in conclusion, what have we learned from our survey here? First of all, countries across the Americas employed Native American figures to manifest their identity and autonomy. These images were adapted from an existing Western tradition of depicting the Americas as an indigenous woman. The various nations evolved, may have emulated each other, and developed and converged on similar symbolic solutions. Ironically, as, as you and I were talking about last fall in October in, uh, in Arizona, ironically, this practice was embraced by states that historically have oppressed Native Americans and devalued women. Okay, when you think about the irony here, it's, it's pretty sharp, okay? The early use of Native American liberty to signal identity and independence underlies later revivals of such images as we just saw both here in the U.S. and in the Dominican Republic. The importance of currency as a symbolic medium, not just as a monetary instrument, is reaffirmed by our review here this evening, okay? And there you have it, folks, okay?